So normal cardiac axis is directed downward and towards the left because the direction of the flow of the current is downward and towards the left. So if the direction of the flow of the current changes, cardiac axis will also changes. If the direction is more towards right, more towards left, then we will call it as left axis deviation. And if the direction is more towards the left right side, then we'll call it as right axis deviation. Is this is this point clear to everyone? Is this point clear to everyone? I'll show it to you on, uh, I'll show it on ECG. First, just understand the basic principles. That the normal cardiac axis is directed downward and towards the left. Because the direction of the flow of the current is downward and towards the left. So the direction of the flow of the current changes, the cardiac axis also changes accordingly. We can assess the cardiac axis from two leads. Lead one and lead AVF. Lead one is on the left side and lead AVF is downward. So if the current is flowing towards lead one and AVF, then it means the cardiac axis is normal because lead one is on the left side and lead AVF is inferiorly. How we are gonna know that the current is flowing towards lead one and AVF or it's flowing away from lead one and AVF. There's the second basic principle. Remember that if the current is flowing towards a lead, it will produce a positive QRS complex. If the current is flowing towards a lead, it will produce a positive QRS complex on ECG. And if the current is flowing away from a lead, it will produce a negative QRS complex on ECG. So by looking at the QRS complexes in lead one and lead AVF, we can assess the direction of the flow of the current. Let's suppose the current is flowing towards lead AVF, but away from lead one. If the current is flowing from away from lead one, like this in this direction, and it is flowing towards AVF in this direction. So the cardiac axis will be between this and this. So we can say that the cardiac axis has deviated to the right because the direction of the flow of the current has changed because the current is now flowing away from the lead AV1, lead one. So how we are gonna know that the current is flowing away from lead one on ECG, how we are gonna know that, I have already told you that if the current is, the current is flowing away from a lead, then it will show a negative QRS on the ECG in that lead. Is that right? Is this point clear to everyone? Yes. The QRS complex in lead one will be downward. And in the lead AVF, it will be upward. The QRS complex is downward in ECG. So it means the current is flowing away from lead one in this direction. And it is positive in AVF. So it means the current is flowing in this direction. So the axis lies between plus 90 and 180 degree, which is the right side of the heart. So we'll say that right axis deviation. 
Now let's suppose QRS complex is negative in AVF. In which direction the current is flowing? If the QRS complex is negative in AVF, can anyone tell me? Upward, upward. Yes, the current is flowing up. Dr. Sambal, are you following me? QRS complex is negative in AVF, so it means the current is flowing away from AVF in this direction. The current is flowing away from AVF in the upward direction. Like this. And QRS complex is positive in lead one, so it means it's flowing towards the lead one. So the axis lies between zero and minus 90. Zero and minus 90 is left axis deviation because it's the left side of the heart. So the cardiac axis has deviated further to the left. Now the cardiac axis is here. So we call it as left axis deviation. Dr. Sambar, I'll repeat it for you. Normally, the cardiac axis is directed downward and toward the left. Can you see this? The normal cardiac axis is between lead one and AVF. So we, we see on ECG that QRS complex is positive in lead one and QRS complex is positive in lead AVF. What does a positive QRS complex in lead one mean? A positive QRS complex in lead one mean current is flowing away or towards lead one. Dr. Sambal, a positive, yes, towards lead one. And a positive QRS complex in AVF means the current is flowing towards or away from AVF. So both the lead one and AVF has a positive QRS complex. Now, let me show you lead one is towards the left side and lead AVF is towards inferiorly. So if the current is flowing between lead, towards lead one and AVF, then it means this is normal cardiac axis because the current is moving downward and towards the left because lead one is on the left side and lead one is AVF is downward. So it means the axis is normal. Now let's discuss the second situation. QRS complex is negative in AVF. QRS complex is negative in AVF. What does this mean? It means the current is flowing away from AVF in the upward direction. And it is positive in lead one. So it is moving towards lead one and upward away from AVF. Now the axis will be between here and here because the current has changed its direction and the axis will be deviated further to the left here. The axis will come here because the current is moving upward. So from downward position, it will move to an upward position because the current has changed its direction due to some pathology in the heart. So this will be left axis deviation. Now let's discuss the third situation. QRS complex is negative in lead one. 
what does this mean qrs complex is negative in lead one what does this mean away from lead one and lead one is on the and lead one is on the left side so current is moving towards the right side away from lead one is right side so it's right axis deviation because the current has changed its direction so the axis has also changed its direction is that right dr sumbal now the final situation qrs complex is negative in avf and negative in lead one both of them have a negative qrs complex what does this mean the current is moving away from lead one towards right yes and upward away from lead avf which is extreme axis deviation or extreme right axis deviation so i hope now it's clear to everyone how to assess a cardiac axis on ecg by just looking at the qrs complexes in lead 1 and avf in pleb keys lead 1 and 2 are given you can use lead 2 in place of avf the principles will remain the same and the axis deviation will remain the same if you use lead 2 in place of avf is there any confusion to anyone so we have assessed three things on an ecg one was rate other was rhythm and third was axis yes one and avf will always be there yes for two you should consider avf for pleb exam if they ask you to assess the axis or there is an uh, there is a question on axis deviation there will be lead 1 and avf or lead 1 or 2 so you do not need to worry because these are the leads from which we can calculate the axis of the heart implication on ecg there are certain causes of there are certain causes of left axis deviation and right axis deviation so if the cardiac axis changes the direction it means there is some pathology in the heart like lateral wall mi lateral wall mi causes right axis deviation and inferior wall mi causes left axis deviation so if there is any pathology in the heart the cardiac axis or the direction of the current will also change so from axis deviation you can diagnose different pathologies of the heart axis of the heart is basically the direction of the flow of the current and if there is any pathology in the heart the direction of the flow of the current will also be changed like lateral wall mi in lateral wall mi the direction of the current is more towards right so it will cause right axis deviation and in inferior wall mi the direction of the current is more towards left so it will cause left axis deviation yes uh, they can give you a scenario of inferior wall mi they can give you a scenario or they can ask you a stem and the stem they will ask that the person will present to you with chest pain 
and he will have uh, inferior wall MI, and you can assess it from by assessing the axis. If there is left axis deviation, then you will say that it's inferior wall MI. And if there is a right axis deviation, then you can say that it's lateral wall MI. There are certain other condition in which axis of the heart is changed. That was recorded in the yesterday lecture. I'll share it on the group. So you can uh, listen to uh, the causes of right and left axis deviation uh, in those lectures. Just for your knowledge, because only one way they are going to ask you about excess deviation in lab one, and that is lateral wall MI and inferior wall MI. How lateral wall MI and inferior wall MI causes excess deviation? And that I explained yesterday because we are short on time today, and I want to complete ECG because cardiology has already taken so much time. So that's why it's better if you listen to the recorded lectures that I'll share in the group after the lecture. So the how all the cardiac axis is deviated towards light and left, you know that. And the causes which did the cardiac axis, uh, you will listen to them in the recorded lectures. So we'll move towards the pathologies of, now we have assessed the rate, rhythm, and axis of the heart. Now the other thing that we are gonna do is assess the waves and segments of ECG. and segment of PCG, P wave, the first wave, if we do things systemically, then we won't miss anything on ECG. But for PLAB exam, as we, you have one minute to assess the ECG, so there are some specific clinchers. If the patient is presented to you with palpitations, or dizziness, no chest pain, then you will look for an arrhythmia or heart blue. And if the patient is presented to you with chest pain, then you will look at look for the ST segment changes. So for PLAB exam, as you have only one minute, so focus on the stem of the question. If in the stem they are mentioning that the person is presented to you with palpitation and dizziness, then you will look straight away at the rhythm lead lead two of the heart. And you will find any abnormality in the rhythm. And if the stem, they mention that the patient is presented to you with chest pain, then you will look for ST segment changes. And as we discussed in the previous lectures that left bundle, new onset left bundle branch block is equal to MI, so you will look for these two things in an ECG. If a person present to you with chest pain and they give you an ECG to assess, then you will look straight away at the ST segments in different leads, or you will look for left bundle branch block. If in the stem they mention chest pain. EVA pathologies are usually not asked in the exam. We are uh, discussing it just for our knowledge in practical life. So what does P wave represent on an ECG? The P wave represent on an ECG, the depolarization of the atrium depolarization of the atria, depolarization of the right atria and the left atrium. Atrial depolarization is represented on P wave. So if there is right atrial hypertrophy, right atrium is enlarged. The amount of current that is generated in the right atrium will also become enlarged. 
so the amplitude of p wave is will increase because the vertical boxes represents the voltage and the horizontal boxes represents the time the vertical boxes represents the voltage and the horizontal boxes represent the time so if the amplitude of the p wave is increased which we call as p pulmonal or p pulmonal let me show you an ecd can you see this p wave can you see this p wave if you see this kind of p waves on in ecd before qrs complex this p wave has an high amplitude or high voltage p wave when you see this kind of p waves it means it's p pulmonal tall or peaked p wave like tall or tented t wave if the p wave is tall or peaked just like a peak then we call it as p pulmonal and it is due to right atrial enlargement or right atrial hypertrophy so if there is right atrial enlargement you will see a p pulmonal pulmonal on ecg now look at another abnormality of p wave now look at these p waves can you see bifid p waves this is qrs complex this is p wave now look at this p wave this is not a smooth p wave it has two or bifid p wave can you can you appreciate the bifurcation of the p wave the splitting of the p wave so if there is a splitting of the p wave we call it as p mitral splitting of the p wave is called p mitral and if there is left atrial enlargement we will see p mitral on ecg so now we know three pathologies of p wave one is absent p wave which is atrial fibrillation short tooth p wave which is atrial flutter peaked b p tall or peaked p waves p pulmonal which shows right atrial enlargement and bifid p waves or splitting of the p wave which is called p mitral and which shows left atrial enlargement left atrial enlargement occur you all know that left atrial enlargement occur in mitral stenosis so that's why this wave is called p mitral so oh, this was the important pathologies of p waves p pulmonal p mitral short tooth p waves and absent p waves now what are the pathologies of qrs complexes the pathologies of qrs complexes uh, have been discussed already can you tell me if the qrs complex is broad then what can be the differential diagnosis a broad qrs complex ventricular tachycardia torsi d pointis left bundle branch block excellent svt can anyone tell me that what happens to qrs complex in svt if the qrs complex is broad and monomorphic then it is ventricular tachycardia if the qrs complex is broad and polymorphic then it is torsi d point is if the qrs complex is broad and there are m shaped q 
QRS complexes in lead V6, then it is left bundle branch block. Can any one of you tell me one more condition in which QRS complexes are brought that we discussed in the previous lectures? You must one condition. Yes, in SVT, the QRS complexes are narrow. So if the QRS complexes are narrow, extra systole, Dr. Khadija, excellent. Extra systole or premature ventricular contraction can also cause a broad QRS complex. So let me summarize the normalities of QRS complexes. If the QRS complex is broad and monomorphic, then it's ventricular tachycardia. If the QRS complex is broad and polymorphic, polymorphic means many morphology, the shape and amplitude of the QRS complexes are different, then we call it as torsade de pointes. And broad QRS complexes and M-shape QRS complex in V6 is left bundle branch block and broad QRS complex with a discordant ST and T segment changes. And the broad QRS complex, which has occurred before its time is called premature ventricular contraction. And if the QRS complex is narrow, then the only thing that you need to know for a narrow QRS complex for flap one is SVT. So this was all about the pathologies of QRS complexes and P waves. If anyone wants to ask any questions, then he is welcome to ask, or I will move to the next topic. Okay, no questions. Now we'll discuss the pathologies of PR interval. So uh, what in which condition the PR interval is prolonged? In which condition the PR interval is prolonged? Give me a one word answer. If PR interval is prolonged, then it's a hard block. Yes, hard blocks. In hard blocks, PR interval is prolonged. Yes, all the hard blocks in all the hard blocks, some of its type two has a post constant PR interval. So you pointed out, pointed it out right. Mobitz type two has a constant PR interval, but we can simply say that in hard blocks, usually the PR interval is prolonged. In general, the hard blocks has a prolonged PR interval. So if the PR interval is shortened, can you tell me any condition in which PR interval is shortened? Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, excellent. Shortened PR interval, and what is the other clincher for Wolf Parkinson White syndrome on an ECG? Delta wave. What is a delta wave? What is a delta wave? Shortened PR interval and a delta wave on ECG make the diagnosis of Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. A delta wave is an upward slant of initial. Excellent, you made a very excellent delta wave. So, an upward slant, like Dr. Asif shared, of initial portion of the QRS complex is called delta wave. So 
So now we will come to the abnormalities of ST segments. Before discussing the abnormalities of ST segments, uh, we'll discuss what is J point. J point is the point where the QRS complex terminate and the ST segment begin. The point where QRS complex is terminated and ST segment begin, this point. This is Q, R, and S. Here the QRS complex is finished and from here the ST segment is started. So this is the point. This is the point. And the reference line or the isoelectric line to see if there is elevation or depression of ST segment is this line. or this line you can say, the line between T wave and P wave or TP segment. TP segment is our reference line or isoelectric line in comparison to which we estimate that if there is ST elevation or ST depression. So J point and TP point or TP segment and their importance is clear to you I hope. TP segment is our reference isoelectric line to assess ST elevation or ST depression. Now this is our reference line. Now see that this ST segment is elevated because our reference